And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the Darklands Quartet of, no of Novels, and is currently working on even even more things that we'll probably delve into down the road, the one and only Lynn Kelly. How are you doing today, man? I am well, Mildra. Thank you for inviting me in, and uh, how are you doing this evening? Well, I am currently covered in snow, so there's that. No, I've heard, you know, being from Texas, snow is just a rumor to us. You know, we'll, we'll get a good snow in this area maybe once every 10 years. The rest of the time, it's just our children just think it's lies. We tell them to, uh, to get excited anytime the temperature gets close to freezing. Yeah, I know, I know that flash freezes are, are a thing, but I think that's as far as it goes. Well, every ten no, every ten years, roughly, we'll get a good snow, and we might get two or three good snows in that, in that one time frame, and then it just goes away, and you don't see it again, and the weathermen will try to play up a system coming in, talking about, oh, you know, it, we've got a good chance of snow, and the, the closer the day gets here, the more the chances dwindle, and then we have no snow, so. That's why whenever I even see something in the forecast, I don't even mention it to my kids because they get all excited if there's even the rumor that snow might show up, and it's not going to. So we live in the wrong part of the country. Although um, I've seen what ha I've seen what happens when people who are used to warm weather decide to come up north and um, get their first blast of that cold air. <laughs> They're never prepared. <laughs> no. But 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 at least you know y'all have the equipment uh, to take care of of snow. Y'all have the snow plows, mm -hmm. the icers, the 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 saw, the chains for your tires. I mean, down here we have maybe one snow plow for the whole state, and <laughs> you get a you get a bad snow. You know, you probably the roads are just going to ice up, and you're not going to get it clear because we don't have the equipment to do anything about it. Um. There's also the f there's also the fact that it's um, it's not legally mandatory, but it's practically mandatory to have remote starters for uh, cars around here. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, my truck has a remote starter, but I just do it sometimes in the morning because I'm lazy. I'm like, I'll just get it started, and, you know, so I can get ahead of the game when I gotta take you know take my daughter to school or something. Mm -hmm. So. I'll start with the humble beginnings, as it were. Where <laughs> did the um, where did the bugs start to bite you, as far as fiction writing? It. I would have to go. You. You've got to go back to where. I mean, what really got me into everything would be the movie Jaws. That's my all-time favorite movie. I've seen it about either up to or greater than a hundred times. And that kind of created a, a love for movies. And then after that, I started seeing all kinds of movies. And I remember the first book, if you, it wasn't even really a book, but the first thing I ever wrote was after I saw the movie alien Ridley Scott's alien, which is mm -hmm. on my top five lists of great movies. I saw it, and this is back when we had these, you're probably too young to even remember, but we had these things called Big Chief Tablets. And uh, they would have a Native American on the front, and then you'd open it up, and be it'd be like 50 to 100 sheets of just paper to write on. And I remember, after seeing the movie Alien, sitting down at my grandmother's table, and I started writing a sequel to the movie Alien. <laughs> and I remember, I think I wrote, I, I mean, I really wish I still had it to see how undeveloped I made characters and how uh, you know bad I jumped from scene to scene. But I think I wrote nine or ten pages um, 
I don't think it was anything close to what James Cameron did with Aliens. But I remember I did that, and you know, I enjoyed doing it. Um, then what I would do is, because I was also reading comics at the time, is that I would storyboard a comic. I would draw it and write it on the same kind of paper and then staple it together like a comic book. When I was around 13 or 14 years old, and stop me if you have a question or if I'm droning on or if I'm boring the audience. When I was around 13 or 14 years old, my mom gave me my great grandfather's royal typewriter. It was the old fashioned cast iron typewriter, probably weighed a good 30, 40, 50 pounds, all manual. And she gave that to me. And I decided I wanted to write a story, just create a story on my own. So because I had a love for all things Jaws. The first book I was going to write, I decided was going to be about a shark, but I couldn't write about a great white shark because that was already taken. So I decided to do my favorite shark, the tiger shark. So I wrote a story called tiger shark. I know mm -hmm. great, just imaginative name, but I wrote a story named tiger shark and I put most of my friends in it as characters. Then when I finished that, I decided I'd write a sequel called Tiger Shark 2. And I wrote that. And these were all on, you know, typewritten pages. There was no such thing as, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, ribbon at the time that could overtype. If you messed up, you had to use liquid paper and it didn't look pretty. But I did that. And then I had some friends of mine say, hey, why don't you write a, a, a horror story? So I wrote kind of a zombie horror story. Then I wrote a bunch of s s zombie short stories and I wrote a vampire story. And so to answer long, long answer to a very short question, you know, the, around probably <sighs> Alien came out in 79. Jaws came out in 75. I was somewhere between the ages of seven seven and 11 or so is when I got the writing bug and had been writing in some capacity ever since. Mm -hmm. um, now you meant, you mentioned tiger shark being a evocative name. Well, allow, allow me to give a counter argument with that. Okay. Dino De Laurentiis put out a movie called Orca. That was a, well, it's a Dino De Laurentiis movie. <laughs> so calling it shameless would okay. be redundant. <laughs> hey, okay. I saw that movie, and as a kid, I really liked that movie. Yes, I know it was a horrible movie. And looking back, I'm like, yeah, it was kind of a horrible movie. But um, when I saw, okay, I grew up in a smaller town, Wichita Falls, Texas. And back then, and maybe, maybe you could do it where you were raised, but you could buy a ticket to a movie. And then when the movie was over, if you wanted to see it again, all you had to do was tell the usher, hey, I'm going to see the movie again. Man. Okay. And so it, so oh, I, remember, I did that a lot. <laughs> okay. So I remember I bought a ticket to Orca and I remember I saw it and sat through it twice. In fact, before I even had seen the movie, I bought the ticket and told my mom, I'm going to see it twice. So pick me up from the mall at this, at this time, you know? And I remember liking it. Of course, you know, that was like Bo Derek's first picture. And I just remember as a kid thinking she was gorgeous. And she was gorgeous. But I remember as a, as a young boy, I was like, wow. But um, so, yes, I know the movie was cheesy, but I enjoyed it. You know, it, it, it's part of my childhood. Now, if I were to see it today, I'd probably be embarrassed and go, I can't believe I like that. But uh, anyway, so, yes. I know Orca. They had obviously uh, they hired me to think of a title for that movie. Mm -hmm. um, also, well, gr also, um, well, Great Whites may be maybe the big bad that everybody knows. Um, tiger sharks are nothing to sneeze at. No, in fact, on the list of uh, of um, of man or of dangerous sharks, they come in at number three, and actually. Great whites come in at number two in terms of fatalities. Can you guess which shark has is number one on the list? Which one, tiger? 
No, Tiger's number three. No, Tiger's number three. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Number one is the bull shark. Yeah, that's of... that's what I've heard. That they um, there might be sharks that are bigger, but bull sharks are notoriously aggressive. And they can uh, they can survive in both fresh and salt water. Mm -hmm. So that's that's I think one of the reasons they they've been known to get into freshwater lakes and do some damage. But yeah, bull sharks number one, great whites number two, and my friend the tiger shark is number three. I yeah. bet you didn't think you were getting an oceanographic uh, lesson today, did you? A surprise. <laughs> but not but not an unwelcome one. <laughs> and it's not and something that something that I've learned when it comes when it comes to when it comes to writing over the, over the years um especially especially being from the um tabletop world as I am is that 9 tenths of what you're going to be doing is research. Mm -hmm. Um I I often find myself remembering um, the whole thing with Harv Bennett when he stepped on to be producer for Star Trek Two. At the time, he had not seen a single episode of Star Trek, so he marathoned the entire original series to prep for producing the movie. <laughs> I had not heard that. Yeah. Well, he made a pretty dang good movie because Star Trek Two is considered... He's probably considered the best by most uh, in terms of movies by most fans. Which is the thing that the thing that is the thing that's also interesting as a um, as a historian for me. Nineteen eighty two is one of the singular best years for science fiction and fantasy film. Were there better films that came out in other years? Yes. Were there worse films that came out in other years? Yes. <laughs> but in terms of the sheer number of classic films that all came out in one year, 1982 is is one of those ones that's hard to top. Because Star Trek II came out that that year, Beastmaster came out that year, The Thing. Came Ooh, out Tanya that Roberts. Year. That when I think when I mm -hmm. think uh, Beastmaster, I think Tanya Roberts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I said, all all this stuff all this stuff came out that came out that year. Oh, John Carpenter's The Thing mm -hmm. came out that year. Yeah. And that was a great movie. It was a great movie, but I was probably way too young to see it when I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Let me ask you. Okay, you had the, the see the movie back to back where I was from. And this is because my mom got tired of going to movies that she got scared at. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the rules that if you walked up with your parents or your mom or your dad, and they bought you the ticket to the R-rated movie, you were allowed to go in. Your parents did not have to come with you back then. Yeah, I remember that kind of, uh, I had to deal with the tail end of that kind of thing, but um, <laughs> I, will, I will admit I, um, I got away with a few, a few too many R going to a few too many R-rated films because, well, when, when, you're as t when you're as tall as some adult at that point, nobody really oh, asked. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I mean, uh, I remember several times like my mom, you know, would would buy us tickets, and then sometimes she couldn't, and you know, I would occasionally I would buy a ticket to the PG movie, walk in, and then you know, do the do a beeline for the R-rated movie that I really wanted to see. <laughs> you know, um, every once in a while I'd walk up, at, you know, this when I was like 15 years old, I'd walk up and actually buy a ticket for the R-rated movie because they weren't going to ID me. Yeah. And uh, so you know, it just it just depends. The thing, the stupid things you do when you're a kid to try to go see R-rated movies because you know you have a a, a, a horror or science fiction or a or a fantasy itch that uh, n nothing in the PG realm can scratch, except for maybe Star Trek Two. Yeah. So, with that with that in mind, given how you talked about the how you went from the inspiration of an idea to that particular story, um. Now, for first off, what was the what was the inspiration to do um, Darklands? Because obviously, when I met you at um, when I met you at Cowtown, that was my that was uh, my introduction to your work. Well, um, 
I had I'd been writing and I had actually written a a thriller that I tried to shop around and it took me you talk about research that book took me somewhere around nine years to write and research because I was trying to get everything accurate and when that book came to not I was like, you know, I don't want to be beholden to this world in terms of reality, because if you play in this world, I don't care what you're writing, you have to have some knowledge of what's going on in it. But I was like, if I created my own world, well, then I write the rules. I, you know, I, I, I make the rules. And so I was like, you know, I think my next book you know, needs to be in the fantasy or the science fiction realm because that would be, that would be something I could do and I could actually spend more time writing than researching. So I didn't have an idea per se. I just knew that's where I wanted to take it eventually. So flash forward and I was in a, it was like, it, it, it was like a, Sunday school or a, a Bible study class. And one of the participants was a Catholic school teacher. And he started discussing the concept of, um, of uh, purgatory. Mm -hmm. And they got into the conversation, and all of a sudden, my mind drifted into, what if there was some world that li that existed between life and death and time? Just It was between life and death. It was time agnostic. It was just in its own place, and we had no, no knowledge of it. And I remember I flipped over my worksheet that I was supposed to be taking notes on, and I started building this world and I started building characters and after by the time the class was over I had I was in my own little world figuratively <laughs> and literally almost mm -hmm. and I had written I had script I had I had designed the dark lands I had designed the story behind it I had created the main characters and I had basically scripted out the entire story from book one to the end. Um, now, at the time, I had originally planned it out as a five-book series. But when I finished with book number two and saw where I was going, I realized that if I did a five-book series, then I would have... Book four would probably be a very, very, very light on story and serve as nothing more as a bridge from book three to book four. And I decided that it might be better if I just did a four book series. And I remember I had I was at a uh, I was at a school. It was a middle school, I believe. And I was speaking to the I was speaking to the English classes about writing and about my book and everything like that. And they got into questions and they said, well, you know, this is back when I only had book two out. I had I was just about to start writing book three. And one of the students asked how long the book was going to be, how long the series was going to be. And I said, my original design was five. I said, but as I've gotten further along, I realize that might be, for lack of a better word, too ambitious because I, I know where the story needs to go. And if I take it to five, I may end up uh, uh, making more fluff than story. Mm -hmm. And I remember I looked out to the class and I <laughs> still remember it. I sat there and said, so what do y'all think? Should I have a, a four book series? and have book four just really, really big? Or do you think I should do a five book series and just have book four and five kind of mediocre in length? 
and they all raise their hands going, oh, make just, just a four book series and make four really, really thick. And um, so that was kind of what pushed me along the way. Yeah. Is, you know. Now, I've, now when it comes to when it comes to Darklands, you mentioned the whole concept of um pur of purgatory, and when I talked with you about it um, at the con, you kind of gave off the impression that the Darklands, where the story takes place, is a kind of place where think where things from pa from past and present exist. That is absolutely correct. Um. The Dark Lands, as I said, and uh, I'm not really giving any spoilers away here, but is a is a world, like I said, that exists between life, death, and time. Now, mm -hmm. it was created at time's inception. It was created as a, a as a prison, a a a a um a prison, a dimensional prison prison, if you will where the most darkest, evilest, vile souls ever to walk the earth or the living world, as it's called in the series, when they die, their soul is immediately sucked into this vortex, which takes them to the dark lands where they dwell. Well, that's all fine and well, but for every, forgive the, trite expression for every yin there must be a yang so mm -hmm. in order to keep the dark souls at bay people that are uh a little bit more benevolent must also be drawn into there to balance it out so for every dark soul that's there a benevolent one must also join now the only way if you haven't figured it out to get to the dark land is literally to die. Now, I always get the, the this question, so I kind of jump ahead of it. Mm -hmm. And that, that doesn't mean die, pronounced dead, uh, buried, and everyone moves on. It couldn't be as simple as someone is uh, on the operating table and uh, something goes wrong, and for 15 seconds they die. Mm -hmm. Well, during that 15 seconds, they could have been absconded into the dark lands and they could have literally lived in the dark lands for days, years, decades, centuries, and then go back into the living world, you know, 15 seconds later, whenever they're revived and live out the rest of their days and be totally ignorant that they were part of this world, that they were helping to stave off this greater evil mm -hmm. or anything like that. So that's, you know, what the dark lands is. And that's, that is the stage on which, you know, my characters have to exist and have to, to, uh, to move on. And the, the story basically the story begins with a, a brother and a sister. The brother's name is Webb. The sister's name is Sundown. They're 17 and 14, respectively. They literally wake up in this world and are uncertain where they, where they are. Because it's not like when they wake up, they look around and they see, like, you know, swirling spirits and stuff like that. It actually looks rather peaceful at a time. When they wake up, they they're on this looks like this this grassy plain that seems to go on forever and the skies kind of look like dark and stormy like a thunderstorm but mm -hmm. it looks like our world it looks like the living world you know but then a few pages in something drastically changes and they suddenly realize they're not in our world anymore and then the story basically the series is told through their eyes. Predominantly, Webb is the uh, main protagonist, but uh, Sundown, in fact, in uh, is kind of the the storyteller for book three, which is interesting because 
Sun, Sundown is a 14 year old girl. So as a 52, well, at the time I was in my forties, mm -hmm. 40 year old, 40 plus year old man trying to channel a 14 year old girl as I wrote, I didn't know if I'd be doing a good job. Now I have two daughters, so I can kind of, you know, kind of, you know, reflect on them. And of course I have a wife and can reflect on her, but it was pretty much just like, okay, I hope I'm doing this right. And ironically, when all is said and done, when I always ask people, okay, and they've read the whole series, I'll say, which book was your favorite? Almost all of them point to book three. And when I ask, okay, what's the reason? They always tell me, well, Sundown has always been my favorite character. So I was... <laughs> I was like, okay, well, I, I guess I knew, I guess I did an okay job writing from the perspective of a 14 year old girl, even though I know, have no idea what that is, you know, what, what that would be like. And unfortunately you can't use the, you can't use the same line that, um, you can't, you can't use the same line that Jack Nicholson di did when he, when <laughs> in what, in that film where he was asked, how, how do you write women so well? <laughs> oh, what, what was it? Was it? Uh, he goes, I think of a man and then I take away all, was it reason and rationality? Or reason and like accountability. That? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I can laugh at that because I'm sitting here by myself, but if my wife were in here, I'd have to feign indignance and say, Mildred, that is horrible. Why would you say anything like that? But uh, it is funny. If. Well, I'll put I'll put it this way: if she if she fi if she finds out about the podcast after the fact, I'll just say we here only we here only apologize to ra to races, colors, creeds, ethnicities, orientations, and so on that we haven't offended yet. <laughs> if we haven't offended you yet, don't worry; we'll get to you eventually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Don't worry, I'll, I'll you know, hang out. I'll, I'll get, to, I'll get to it eventually. And mm -hmm. I'm one of those people who always say, you know, it's really difficult to offend me. If you, as long as you are not personally attacking my, uh, my, you know, my family, then, uh, you know, it, it's really hard to offend me. <laughs> that and um, there's a few other yeah. people here in the temple who have very military humor. Let's say. And <laughs> I understand that I have good friends. I have good friends that are that are ex-military, so I know exactly the kind of humor to which you were referring. Mm -hmm. And anybody who is thin-skinned should not handle should not cannot last one second with that kind of humor. Oh yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Now, oh now um, I. I recently did a I recently did a bit of a deep dive thing with a few friends where we um ended up revisiting um Jurassic Park and okay. specifically making comparisons between the novel and the film. All right. And now true true story, I read the novel first before I ever saw the before I ever saw the movie. As okay. did I. Um and of course so you so you should know as well as I do that the two of them are completely night and day different from each other yeah i mean they 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 really are in fact if you saw jurassic park 2 the lost world mm -hmm. there are actually a few scenes from the lost world that were are kind of taken from the first book uh like the waterfall scene so yeah. i yeah. you know is you know but yes they are very very night and day. But what I want, what I do want to focus on with, with bringing up um, somebody like the late Michael Crichton is a lot of his a lot a lot of his books are. You end up having with it whenever it comes to any sort of high concept um, idea. You tend to ha you tend to have some significant extremes. You either have cases of the high concept um, being ba being rooted in how, and how it how it goes wrong or how it can potentially go wrong like what Jurassic Park being an example Westworld being an right. example um right. and so and so on quite a lot of them are from Crichton um or you have cases where where this high concept thing is seen through the lens of specific characters and how it and how it affects them 
Would you right. say that the Darklands book is more of a character focused thing than a um, world slash concept set focused thing? That is a good question. And one that in normal circumstances, if you emailed me that question, I would stare at my laptop for an hour trying to cultivate the right answer. But uh, that being said, I would say it probably is more character focused. I mean, the stakes are huge. I mean, you, you have an idea, you know what the stakes are, mm -hmm. but you're seeing it, you know, through Webb's perspective or Sundown's perspective. And Webb is a 17 year old boy who's got a very, very bad anger streak you know, so he's not, he, he's thinking through that way and, and, and everything. And, uh, sundown's a little bit more rational and she, but she has her moments where things just don't go right. So, uh, yeah, it would be through, you would see it through them. Um, you know, it wouldn't be like, uh, uh, well, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, Jurassic park, you, mm -hmm. Basically, you saw a lot of it through, um, uh, I mean, a little bit through Malcolm, but most of it was through, um, um, I, don't know, I can't even remember his name, uh, Grant. Most of it was through Grant's perspective, mm -hmm. you know. So, anyway, so yeah, it's it's more it's more character. I mean, mm -hmm. the stakes are real, the the. Well, I mean, real for fantasy novel. It's not like you're gonna look at it and go, "Wow, this really happened." But, um, but yeah, I will have to say it, it. It's it's not like this monumental concept that you're like, "Oh my lord!" You know, you're you're seeing it from the character. The character is your guide. But uh, Crichton, it's you know, it's interesting you mentioned Crichton. Kind of going off script here for a second, but Crichton is a God rest his soul is a is a unique author. He could write and did write in almost every genre and was good at it and was accepted at it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had you know Jurassic Park, which was you know thriller fantasy. You had Westworld, which was you know sci-fi. You had um uh, airframe which was more political thriller you had state of fear which was a discussion or a thriller about climate change you know then you had uh what was it i think it was uh it was called i think it was eaters of the dead which became uh the 13th warrior and that was more um vikings and uh, and everything so yeah he he just, I would, you know, if someone ever said, okay, you get a magic wand and you can have the talent of any writer that's out there, who would you pick? Who would you have picked? You know, Crichton, Crichton might be my number one in terms of just ability, talent, and the fact that he could just do whatever he wanted to do. And he was a doctor mm -hmm. on top of all that. Although I do, th I do think his background... When I look at when I look at Jurassic Park and the Andromeda Strain, I do st I did start to realize a bit of a flaw when it came to his approach due to his background of being a doctor. Mm -hmm. And that is that is um how, that is how he handle that was how he handles um concepts that aren't entirely physical cuz the big criticism I had with Jurassic Park the novel, I don't think he fully understands chaos theory. Okay. He ma he makes a um he makes a common mistake when it comes when it comes to chaos theory because chaos and randomness are not the same thing, especially when it comes to chaos theory. The th the it's um, Chuck Sonnenberg, who's a very good reviewer, um, likened it to the difference between. Someone putting a brick in your backpack before a marathon and someone throwing a brick at you during the marathon. Both of them are going to affect how you perform in it, but one of the, but with one of them, 
the there is a different degree of control than the other. And obviously yeah. that's a bit much of an example, but I like using extreme examples to make points. Well, no, that hey, as a as a as a as a runner, I I don't want a brick thrown at me, so I appreciate that. Didn't in the book Though didn't didn't Malcolm call it Malcolm theory or something instead of chaos theory or did he call it chaos theory in the he book? He didn't. He called it he called it Malcolm theory, but I think that was to, I think that was to highlight the point of this guy trying to act like a rock star. Okay, all also, right. Also, okay. um, I get I get the feeling that if he act that if that calling it Malcolm theory was was kind of a back door for him. So that if he called it chaos theory and got ripped a new one by people who ah. actually are more familiar with chaos theory, he could find he could have a convenient exit. Yeah, see, there goes that goes back to your whole research thing that mm -hmm. you just that you mentioned. You see, if you're writing a book, even if it's fantasy, mm -hmm. and you're dealing with this world, you still have certain disciplines that you have to follow, which requires research, lest a, 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 a very picky reader calls you out on it and says, hey, you can't do that or you can't do this. You know, even though the fact that you're talking about dinosaurs taking over the world or you're talking about giant rabbits or cats taking over the world, which is totally impossible, that one person be like, hey, hey, you sat there and you said that they got away in a uh, 2016 Ford F-150 Raptor. Well, you know as well as I do that there was a gap between 2014 and 2017 and no Raptors were made, so you don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and you, obvi so you obviously, be... it's obviously when it comes to that sort of thing, hyperbole is the sweet poison. But mm -hmm. now, when it comes to the Darklands it's, itself, um, I do remember joking when you said when you said about how it's how the skies are all, are always gr always gray and dr and dreary like that despite the mm -hmm. area being quote unquote bright. I described it mm -hmm. as oh oh it's like sp oh it's like spring back home. <laughs> um, but the but I think I think it's made I think you made very clear that the set that within the setting. The area is the area is not exact is not exactly safe. There's pla there are places that may be safer, but you're never truly safe. Exactly. Um because the dark lands, you know, it's it's this massive area and almost anywhere you go, you know, you've got the green grass and you got the dark skies. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a Kind of, it's done that way, kind of as a, as a positive and negative, showing you the duality of the place. But the, the the people, the benevolent people, the ones that are there, they all dwell in a kind of a castle, a white castle that's like a cube almost, mm -hmm. and it's called Glorian. It's one of those these places where, when everyone's in it. At night, the walls melt in on the door so that there's no way, you know, no way outsiders can get in or anything like that. And you're relatively safe. And I say relatively safe there because as the story moves on and as the book moves on, the place becomes less and less safe. But outside in the Darklands, there are, there are pitfalls for everybody. All of the malignant souls the evil souls they're called vindicatives mm -hmm. they all dwell in a forest called the dead forest of keenan it um i always kind of imagined it uh it's like a forest with a bunch with a bunch of thin spindly trees kind of like if you ever saw tim burton's batman when yeah you know, he was leaving wayne manor and you look out at the trees and they're all like pencil thin and they're all kind of gray and everything. Well, that's kind of looks like that. And the ground is ash and, and uh, it, uh, the, the place reeks of, of, of burning flesh. And uh, if you're not a vindicative and you try to cross into there, you can be driven mad. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's polar opposite of what Glorian is, but throughout 
the land, there are also pitfalls, literally and figuratively, that are, I use the term agnostic before, I'll use it again, agnostic in terms of whether, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a Glorian or a Vindicative. If you stumble across it, you know, it will it will take you just as well as as, uh, as anyone else. Like, I, I think I discussed with you, like, one of the pitfalls is a is something called a veil hole. Mm-hmm. And it, when you walk up to it, it is generally a perfectly circular hole. And when you look in it, it, you know, it's just pure onyx black. It's like that old, you know, you look into the abyss, the abyss also looks into you. Well, it's abyss. And if you kind of stick your hand in it, it's just bitter cold. Well, the thing is, if you were to fall into a veil hole, a veil hole has no end. Once you fall in, you fall forever. And so that's something you have to avoid in the in 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 the dark lands. You know, there's a there's also a place called Lake Lascivious. And without going into too much detail, because it's explained later, it it, it it's water. But it happens to be the collection of water, the water from ice that is representative of emotions and passions that in the living world were, were never experienced, lost dreams, lost passions, and they all melt in this. And if you touch it, well, all of a sudden you basically unintentionally imbibe on all that passion and it can just really waylay you and make you, you know, just just super passionate about random things. So, I mean, there are pitfalls throughout that, that again, it, it doesn't matter if you're good or bad. They, you, you, you come across them and don't know how to appreciate them. Well, then, you know, you're just another statistic, so to speak. Yeah. And, um, well, I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure, um, you know, there's probably an Australian or um or Eastern Europe joke I can make about that kind of thing, but that's <laughs> but <laughs> that's kind that's kind of overdone because we all know that every everything in Australian wilderness wants to kill you. Yeah, my uh, my dad was a pilot for Braniff Airlines, and he used to have to take flights over the south over South America and over the jungle, and he said they'd be flying. And he said, you'd look in every direction as far as you could go and there'd be nothing but the trees. And he'd say that, you know, we always feared that if something happened to us on that flight and we crashed, he said that was it because there's no way in or out. And he used to talk about going to a museum uh, in South America and they would show some of the bugs and creatures that they pulled from the the deep jungles. Mm -hmm. And he said they were so horrifying that he was convinced that if they were crashing, he said he would make sure that he would he would he would go straight into a nosedive so that he would die instantly because he didn't want to have to contend with what's in those forests. No, I've um, <laughs> I've well, <laughs> one of my one of my early introductions to that kind of thing is seeing exactly what happens when when you get a dozen or so piranhas all good and pissed off. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you, you you don't want to do that. There, I was I was just actually reading a funny story about um, piranhas, and they were saying whether they deserve their reputation, and they said that you know they're horrible and they can do horrible things. But they said what started a reputation. I think it was Teddy Roosevelt was visiting uh, the that region and uh, the like the king of that particular area, the or maybe the men, the prime minister, whatever wanted to give him a show so they took a bunch of piranhas and sequestered them and kept them starved and hungry and angry Mm -hmm. for days so that they hadn't touched anything and then as soon as they he knew they were you know basically all you know just in a boil and ready to go you know they had roosevelt sit down and they threw a cow into the water and of course the uh the, the piranhas just devoured it because they hadn't eaten in days and they were ticked off. And they said that, you know, so they can do it. They said, but normally 
piranhas aren't that angry and aren't that hungry. But uh, it's just that's how they got their reputation. Yeah, which I hey if you hey wanted to create a show and um, mission accomplished, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I don't. I, but uh, that being said, if someone told me that I could go swimming in the lake, but it was known to have piranhas. I think I would be like, eh, not so much. I think I'll just sit on the shore and watch everybody else swim. I've I've read too many Darwin Awards to take that risk. <laughs> That's a good one. And I've seen I've um I've seen I've seen what happens when so when when somebody when somebody says how bad could it be, which pro tip never say that. Oh yeah, no. That's like you know saying what could go wrong. No, no, don't ever do that. Mm -hmm. Because when you say what could go wrong, well, you say that you're about to see what's going to go wrong. Yeah, but now, given the fact that you're dealing with an, with a land where there's a where there are where there are threats for days, first thing I first thing I wanted to ask, given the um, castle that the more but the more benevolent souls um, will congregate in. The way you describe it, something that immediately came to mind was the prison settlement in The Walking Dead. I have not ever watched The Walking Dead. I know I'm one of the few people on the face of the earth that has not, but just so you understand, I have nothing with zombie movies or anything like that. But most when it comes to like zombie movies and everything mm -hmm. i can see a movie but if they make a series out of it i get really tired of zombies i don't care what else the story is after around three or four episodes and i'm like eh, not not for me you know it's kind of like do you remember that uh vampire show that was on nbc couple years back um it was written by i think Guillermo del toro wrote it um oh good gosh wish i could remember um what it was but it was really well done and the special effects were really good and the acting was really good but um after after one season i was tired of it i was like okay i can only take so much of this you know and i was like i i'm 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 tired of this uh can we can we watch something else you know um anyway so uh, i just that's why anyway sorry never never watch sorry yeah. sorry 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 um when it come when it comes to, now, given given all that, and I know I know I asked you this when I when I met you, but what are so, what are some of the means that people who've gotten sucked into this land have to defend themselves within the uh, dark, within the dark lands? The every now again, I'm speaking from the perspective of the good guys. Mm -hmm. The bad guys are just vicious, and that's their power. They're vicious, you know. Vicious, vicious, and vicious. Mm -hmm. Every benevolent, every good person that lands there has one special ability that is inherent to what their personality was in the living world. And there are a certain set of powers. And when they're there, they learn what they are. Uh, Webb is what's called a disperser. Webb has the ability to basically, he could like take his hand and just basically gesture at somebody and it would create a shockwave that could knock them just, you know, miles away. Or he could slam his fist down towards the earth and split it open. Or he could do anything as subtle, subtle as just waving his finger and creating a, a breeze to, to, to go. So that's like his ability. There are uh people that um are called fugers and they're basically they punch they can they fight and punch very hard their fists they could punch 
they could punch like a building with their fist and completely crumble it. Um, there are there's the most special, most unique, and rare gift in the in the dark lands is uh, that of a reclaimer, and a reclaimer is someone that can rewind time around them. For example, if uh, say that you're sitting there having lunch with someone you just met and you're talking about something, you're getting very passionate and in the middle of it, you accidentally knock over your drink and you spill it all over their nice white pants or whatever they're wearing. If you were a reclaimer, you could immediately freeze time right then and there, draw it back to before you did that, and then just play this scene over again, minus knocking over the drink. Now, that person will never, ever know that alternate reality happened, but you will be aware of any and all realities that you've changed. So mm -hmm. that's what a reclaimer can do. Now, Reclaimers are the most special gifts and the and the most uh, only the most mature um, uh, Glorians possess this ability. And because of that, uh, only women are reclaimers. Yep. As uh, one one character says, makes an illusion saying, uh, well, that's basically like, that's kind of sexist. And the lady turns on him and says, you know, show me a mature man and we'll have a, you know, have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, is, um, is a nice little, is a nice little way to, ki to kill off that particular, um, bit, that particular bit of, ar bit of arguing o over what is and isn't ist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when you were when you were writing the the kind of abilities that people can have in the dark lands, did you have a kind of um, was there a, was there a brainstorm moment where you were just um writing down different um, potential abilities and just narrowing down the list, or did you always have a few in mind? I had a couple in mind. I had the reclaimer in mind. I had the disperser in mind. Then. I started brainstorming on other abilities, and like you said, I had certain uh, I, had, I had certain abilities written down, and then kind of kind of weeded out what I what wouldn't make sense, and then kept with uh, I think it was in the end like seven seven gifts, um, and throughout the series, you're introduced to to the gifts. I mean, I don't I don't do the all right, everybody, here's all the gifts, you know, in, in like book one, one chapter. Mm -hmm. You know, you find out a few in book one, you find out about a, another two in book two, and um, book three, you find out basically the rest. And then, you know, uh, book four, I didn't have, I wanted everything resolved because book four is the finale and I got a story to tell and I don't have time to talk about special abilities. Yeah. Um. When it and when it comes to the, when it comes to those abilities, um, with any sort with any sort of ability or the like, there it's always, in my opinion, it's always important to have some sort of catch, you know, some sort of thing to say, to to go into why they don't just use it all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, when it comes to things like recla reclaimers and the like, what would the what would that catch be? Well, you know, that's the one that has the greatest catch because you find out that reclaimers, their role in the Darklands is basically to, 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 to stop horrible things from happening. So something horrible happens, they draw time back so they can try to go around it and stop it from happening. And usually these horrible things are like, friends and peers being killed, dying in horrible ways by the vindicatives. And so reclaimers often have seen so much and have had to rewind so much and become aware and, and are basically 
they basically see things and, and remember things that no one else does. So they have no one else to talk about. You know, Im imagine seeing like your best friend, like, you know, disemboweled or dismembered. Uh, and then you draw time back to, to save them. And, and then they're, they killed some other horrible way and you draw time back and you're finally able to save them. It's an emotional experience and it's emotionally exhausting but you're the only one that ever knew it happened to that person. The, you know, it, the only reality they know is the one they're currently existing. They didn't see them. They didn't see themselves. You know, they, did, they, they weren't aware of that. They may have died three times, you know? And so it is an emotional burden that really starts to wear on, um, the reclaimers. In fact, um, the one of the other main characters is a uh, is a girl named Raven, mm -hmm. and she's a reclaimer, and she's kind of she's basically Sundown's teacher, and Raven has a very reserved personality for for m much of the first book and much of the series because she has seen so much that she has just kind of tried to shut herself off from everything. So that is the catch all for being a, a reclaimer is that you don't have an emotional relief because you have no one to talk to about it. Um, so that's their catch. Everyone else's catch is more about control because as Webb has to learn that it, it, it sounds, um, like you say, it sounds very dark side of the force ish, which I'm sure that, you know, had some influence on, on, on me. Cause you know, that you, you, as a writer, you, you, you're influenced by great works, whether it's movies or books or whatever. But the problem with, you know, like Webb is that he, you have to be able to find your abilities outside of anger, you can't use anger to tap into your abilities. You have to use something greater. And he has a hard time initially tapping into his abilities without using anger. And as they try to explain, they say, well, you keep doing that. Then the vindicatives, or more specifically, the leader of the vindicatives called the dark man, will be able to use that against you because he plays in that field of just dark emotion. Mm -hmm. And if all you are is just, you know, just using this anger and this raw emotion to channel your energies, that'll come back and bite you eventually and be manipulated to, to maybe turn you. And so that's everyone else's catch is to not let anger be the precursor to any ability they have. Yeah. Um, and I can, that's, that's definitely something I can see. And as far, as far as making a dark side of the force comparison, um, real, really that, that particular motif, pr even though a lot of people probably won't admit it predates, um, the whole, the whole concept of the, the whole concept of the force as we, as we understand it, mm -hmm. because of course, keep in mind when it comes to all the things that were influences for Star Wars, if I were to list that off, I could be doing a two-year class on that. And hell, I already, I'm, pre <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure there's some universities that already do. Well, that you could always apply for, you know, professorship. Um, I drink and I swear too much to apply for to to apply for a professorship. Plus, they probably want to have me in a more traditional suit, not in a suit that's all black, like I, like I had just stepped out of the 1920s. Oh, you'd be amazed. I think there are a lot of professors that drink and swear, and a lot of them that can dress however. But, but fine, if you don't want to go off to college and teach, you know, <laughs> you know the 200 influence of Star Wars, you know, as, as taught by Mildred the Monk, okay, fine, I understand. Uh, it's, it's just not... Um, it would. It just. It just would be a bad. It would just be a bad fit for how I work. <laughs> I understand. There's, 
there was also the fact that I would be answerable to other people. <laughs> well, yeah, that's always no fun mm -hmm. when you have to answer to other people, but we all have to answer to other people somehow, sometime. Um, but more, but more on point now, what, given the, given the undertaking that the Darklands was, and since you mentioned that you initially had planned, had planned for four books, but you parsed it down to two after some feedback. What were some... Now, I'm not going to... I don't want to go into spoiler territory with this, but what were some of the big takeaways that you got from the experience and the response of writing this quartet? Mm. Well, let's just kind of go stream of consciousness here. I mean, the first takeaway I had from this literally was that I do not want to write another series for a long, long time. I want to I want to just focus on one story at a time. And the reason being is that on on one side, I had the story that I wanted to get out. So it's like I'm writing the first book and I'm already thinking about books two, three, and four. And I'm just wanting to, I'm rushing through it because I've got so much story to tell. But on the counter side of that, I'd have other great book ideas and I couldn't write them because I was kind of a prisoner to the series because, okay, you know, I'm, I, I don't, I don't have the, the following of a JK Rowling or anything like that, but I had a following. I had people that read my book. And I would get emails uh, or I would get people that would come up to me at the con and be like, when's the next book coming out? And they don't want me to say, oh, eventually, but I'm working on this great other story in the interim. That's not what they want to hear. That would be, you know, they, they want to hear when is book three or book four or the, the series coming out. That that's what that that's what they want. So that's what you write. And any other ideas you got to put on the back burner. Mm -hmm. So writing a series is a monumental task. And I'm not trying to make myself sound like, you know, I, 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 I just completed the, you know, building the Empire State Building or something like that. I mean, but just it, it is it is a task and it takes time and it can be exhausting. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things I drew from it. The other thing I drew from it is that I learned that if you really, really, really develop your characters so that you've got solid characters with solid backgrounds, as weird as this sounds, they will write the story for you. You know, mm -hmm. when I sat down to write the Darklands, I knew where it would start. I knew where it would end and I knew the monumental parts in there. But you still have to connect the dots. And when you have well-developed characters, they literally help you connect the dots because their characterization kind of leads you to where it needs to go. And I found that several times I'd be writing and it almost just seemed like the book was writing itself because the characters knew where it needed to go. And no, I'm not saying I sat there and talked with my characters and had lunch meetings. And no, I'm not that. I'm not that you know centric. But um, I, I I discovered that I just I I you know I just I discovered that um, uh, I um, it also just made me realize that I you know which I always knew, but. Writing a series just helped me to appreciate um, how much I like to write. Mm -hmm. you know, the writing's writing's a bit a big part of me, and I like doing it. Um, and I think I do a good job. There are probably some people out there that, you know, some reviewers that will say, you know, he can't, you know, write his way out of a paper bag. But I I enjoy writing, and I think during the evolution of the series from book one to book four, I became a much better writer. Uh, back when I flipped through like book one, just to every once in a while, I'll grab one of my books, just flip through it, just to read something, just to see if I can catch something that I'm 
go, oh, maybe I could, could have rewritten this or just to see if something, you know, held its value. I'll sit there and see how I wrote for book one and then compare it to book four. And I'll be like, you know, I grew as a writer. You know, I, I, I think I'm a better writer by the time I finished book four than I was when I started book one. All right. Now, given what you said, I think I can already assume that the next project that you're working on is going to be a standalone thing, not the start <laughs> of a series. You no, know, it's funny. Uh, when all was said and done, I had someone that had read book four, and they emailed me, and they said I read it, and they were very complimentary. They liked it, and they said, oh, my, yeah, it was great. And they said, so uh, is there going to be a book five? And, you know, I wanted to say, okay, did, did you not read like my acknowledgement at the end where I said, this is it, it's over. Did you not look at the cover page where it says the final chapter, you know? Uh, so, um, but yes, the next book I'm writing is a standalone. Um, it is, uh, I'm writing it now. Uh, it is uh, the working title and probably the final title is called Tracks, and it is about a pack of werewolves that use the train system throughout the United States to travel throughout the United States, mm -hmm. and a young boy that finds out their secret and what happens after he finds out about them, and I am probably... Probably around a year or more away from its publication. I've still got probably another 100 pages or so until the first draft will be complete. And then there'll be the rereads and the edits and the other drafts and, and, and the like before, any, before it goes into any kind of publication. But um, that's where I am. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, I mean... That's that. That's also the the benefit of writing a series is you know where you're going. Mm -hmm. The drawback of not writing a series is, as a writer, you generally have several book ideas in your head, and it's hard to decide which one to do next because you're like, oh, well, this this you know this has some merit. Oh, and this one has merit. Well, this one might be better, or I really want to write this one. So after I finish this. I've got you know three or four different other book ideas in my head. I've got to figure out where where to take it. But uh, uh, this one will be a this one will be a standalone. But for those that have read The Darklands, there are a few very small references to The Darklands in this book. It's one of those things that if you read The Darklands you'll see the nod that's given. Mm -hmm. If you didn't, it's not going to matter. It's not going to change the story one, one, one bit. It'll just be a little kind of thing that goes over your head and really Easter doesn't. Take... Yeah, exactly. An Easter egg. Very, yeah, very good. Just, just a little Easter egg. If you read the book, you'll catch it. If you don't, then Hey, so be it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll def I'll definitely be keeping an eye out on that kind of thing. Especially since, especially since, um, given that you're dealing with um, were werewolves got on the tracks, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that's, I'm pretty sure that somebody can um, break out the Steely Dan soundtrack um, play playlist in order to, re in order to read through that one just to set the mood. Well, actually, <laughs> I was, I was kind of like, uh, I always imagined the uh, the start of the book, uh, hearing, uh, um, um. Uh, uh, the uh, city of New Orleans playing, you know, by, by um, what what's his name? Uh, uh, well, Willie Nelson, uh, Ar Arlo Guthrie, City of New Orleans, mm -hmm. and then um, I always thought that this one song that was kind of uh, uh, under underrated um, by Walter Egan. It was called Full Moon Fire, and it was actually about a guy turning into a werewolf, <laughs> and it was an 80s hit, or semi-hit, obscure. I always, when, I always think that that would be an awesome, you know, for soundtrack for the, the book as well. But hey, I love Steely Dan, so yeah, 
you can throw you can throw Steely Dan in there, and you mm-hmm. will not have sent me in the least bit. Yeah, but with that, with all that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule, and I would say braving the hell that is time zones, but we're in the same time zone, so moot there. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey. Uh, Milder, I appreciate the in, the invitation mm-hmm. and I appreciate the conversation. This has been, uh, I've really enjoyed this and mm-hmm. enjoyed the questions and enjoyed you uh, giving me time to, to elaborate. Mm-hmm. And of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, hey. You know, since you you blindfolded me and and brought me in, you know, um, I, I, I'll, I'll have to kind of you know see if I can find my way back. But uh, I I would love love to come back, uh, love to come back, and maybe my other book will be out by then, and we can talk about that one. All right. And uh, hopefully, hopefully you'll uh, you'll head down this way and uh, come to another Comic Con, maybe April or May time frame. April or May that might that might be that might be putting it a little bit tight but um, okay. everything's always in flux so you never know what you never know what can go down. Well, um again, I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed the conversation. Yep. And uh hey, best of luck to you in the show. My pleasure. My pleasure. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!